Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we'll be reading Matthew 9, verses 1 to 13, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Matthew. Please take a moment to pause and ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Let us notice in the first part of this passage our Lord's knowledge of men's thoughts. There were certain of the scribes who found fault with the words of Jesus as he spoke to the paralytic. They said secretly among themselves, This man blasphemes. They probably supposed that no one knew what was going on in their minds. They had yet to learn that the Son of God could read hearts and discern spirits. Their malicious thought was publicly exposed, and they were put to open shame. There is an important lesson for us in this. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account, Hebrews 4.13. Nothing can be concealed from Christ. What do we think of in private when no man sees us? What do we think of in church when we seem so grave and serious? What are we thinking at this moment while these words pass under our eyes? Jesus knows. Jesus sees. Jesus records. Jesus will one day call us to give account. It is written that God will judge the secrets of men according to my gospel by Jesus Christ, Romans 2.16. Surely, we ought to be very humble when we consider these things. We ought to thank God daily that the blood of Christ can cleanse us from all sin. We ought often to cry, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let us notice in the second place the wonderful call of the Apostle Matthew to be Christ's disciple. We find the man, who afterwards was the first to write a gospel, sitting at the tax collector's booth. We see him absorbed in his worldly calling and possibly thinking of nothing but money and gain. But suddenly, the Lord Jesus calls to him and to follow him and become his disciple. And at once Matthew obeys. He makes haste and does not delay to keep Christ's commandment, Psalm 119, verse 60, and arises and follows him. Let it be a fixed principle in our religion that with Christ nothing is impossible. He can take a tax collector and make him an apostle. He can change any heart and make all things new, Let us never despair of anyone's salvation. Let us pray on and speak on 
and work on to do good to souls, even to the souls of the worst. The voice of the Lord is powerful, Psalm 29 verse 4. When he says, by the power of his spirit, follow me, he can make the hardest and most sinful obey. Let us observe Matthew's decision. He waited for nothing. He did not tarry for a convenient time, Acts 24 verse 25. And he reaped in consequence a great reward. He wrote a book which is known all over the earth. He became a blessing to others as well as bless to his own soul. He left a name behind him which is better known than the names of princes and kings. The richest man in the world is soon forgotten when he dies. But as long as the world stands, millions will know the name of Matthew, the tax collector. Let us notice, in the last place, our Lord's precious declaration about his own mission. The Pharisees found fault with him because he allowed publicans, that is, tax collectors, and sinners to be in his company. In their proud blindness, they fancied that a teacher sent from heaven ought to have no dealings with such people. They were wholly ignorant of the grand design for which the Messiah was to come into the world, to be a savior, a physician, a healer of sin-sick souls. And they drew from our Lord's lips a rebuke, accompanied by the blessed words, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let us make sure that we thoroughly understand the doctrine that these words contain. The first thing needful in order to have an interest in Christ is to feel deeply our own corruption and to be willing to come to him for deliverance. We are not to keep away from Christ, as many ignorantly do, because we feel bad and wicked and unworthy. We are to remember that sinners are those he came into the world to save. And that if we feel ourselves such, it is well. Happy is he who really comprehends that one principal qualification for coming to Christ is a deep sense of sin. Finally, if by the grace of God we really understand the glorious truth that sinners are those whom Christ came to call, let us take heed that we never forget it. Let us not dream that true Christians can ever attain such a state of perfection in this world as not to need the mediation and intercession of Jesus. Sinners we are in the day we first come to Christ. Poor, needy sinners, we continue to be so long as we live, drawing all the grace we have every hour out of Christ's fullness. Sinners, we shall find ourselves in the hour of our death, and shall die as much indebted to Christ's blood as in the day we first believed. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts from these verses. Let us carefully consider what we've heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His 